Good evening. And welcome to City Council, Norman Utilities Authority, Norman Municipal Authority, and Norman Tax Increment Finance Authority meeting of October 23rd, 2018. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilmember Beerman? Here. Councilmember Carter? Here. Councilmember Castleberry? Here. Councilmember Hickman? Here. Councilmember Wilson? Here. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Holman? Here. Councilmember Scott? Here. Mayor Miller? Here. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is approval of the City Council Community Planning and Transportation Committee minutes of August 23rd, City Council Study Session minutes of September 4th, and City Council Norman Utilities Authority, Norman Municipal Authority, and Norman Tax Increment Finance Authority minutes of October 9th. I need a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Second. The motion on the floor is to approve the minutes by a show of hands. All those in favor? Opposed, same sign. That was unanimous. It's a proclamation proclaiming November 2018 as Native American Heritage Month in the city of Norman. I'll entertain a motion to acknowledge receipt of the proclamation. Motion to acknowledge. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. That was unanimous. Hmm. Well, technical difficulty here. <laughs> A proclamation of the mayor of the city of Norman, Oklahoma, proclaiming the month of November 2018 as Native American Heritage Month in the city of Norman. Whereas the American Indian population residing within the city of Norman is represented by a unique and diverse population of Native American Indians from many tribal nations. And whereas this unique population enriches every aspect of our nation, state, and community and provides learning experiences not available to many towns, cities, and communities. And whereas the American Indian population of Norman is represented within every facet of the city, including but not limited to primary, secondary, and higher education, business, and nonprofit organizations, federal, state, and tribal services, health professions, industry, the armed services, religion, law enforcement, entertainment, and the fine arts. And whereas fostering prides in the languages, traditions, and practices that make up the extraordinary richness of the Native American culture is central to our shared progress as a community. And whereas the beauty and the richness of the Native American culture provide a dynamic presence in the city of Norman that attracts visitors from across the state, nation, and world. Now, therefore, I, Mayor of the City of Norman, do here, hereby proclaim the month of November 2018 as Native American Heritage Month in the City of Norman and encourage all citizens to join me in recognizing the contributions made by Native Americans to our community and in celebrating the diversity and character of our community. Uh, I think Johnny Johnson is here to accept the proclamation. Johnny, I saw you just a minute ago. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here to receive this. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much. Oh, you need to turn around and face it. No, Johnny. Oh, I got a face off? Yeah, you have to face us. I'm not used to, no. Thank you very much. Uh, I am the secretary for the Absentee Shawnee Tribe in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Uh, I am the Absentee Shawnee, and I wanted to give you kind of a, a narrative, short narrative on how we got that name, because I'm always asked, what's the absentee in the... Um, 1800s 
the uh, Shawnee tribe was asked to move to a different location in Kansas by 1834 is when they finally decided to do the treaty. By that time, they disbanded. So they said, well, we're going to have to allot these land here for the absentee Shawnee tribes that are not here. So that's where that name stuck. Now, I never really heard that when I was a little boy because I was always a Shawnee Indian. But when we became our own self-governing entity over there in Shawnee is when we started our logo and it was put on there as absentee Shawnee tribe. So I'm proud to be Oklahoman. I'm proud to be an absentee Shawnee tribe. Also, I'm proud that I reside here in the city of Norman. And for this day, I'm going to say no more rain in November for <laughs> any bad weather also. So thank you very much for doing this for me. Thank Appreciate you, Appreciate very much. Item number five is a proclamation proclaiming the month of November as Veterans Month in the city of Norman. I'll entertain a motion to acknowledge receipt of the proclamation. Motion to acknowledge. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. That was unanimous. Proclamation of Norman, Oklahoma, proclaiming the month of November 2018 as Veterans Month in the city of Norman, whereas the armistice was signed at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, which marked the end of hostilities for World War I, and whereas November 11th was declared a national holiday in June of 1926, and whereas November 11th was renamed Veterans Day in 1954, to honor all veterans of all wars, and whereas our nation's military is serving on all the continents in the world in peacekeeping or humanitarian roles and in actual combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, and whereas we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to these patriots whose service and sacrifice have allowed us to raise our children in a country blessed with peace and prosperity and to shape a brighter future for nations around the world. And whereas a Veterans Day parade will be held Sunday, November 11th at 1.30, beginning at the corner of Jenkins Avenue and David Bourne Boulevard and ending at the Veterans Memorial located at Reeves Park to honor all veterans. And whereas in grateful recognition of the contributions of those who have served in our armed forces and with deep respect for America's veterans who have answered the highest calling of citizenship, patriotism, and generosity of their service. Now, therefore, I, Mayor of the City of Norman, Oklahoma, do hereby proclaim the month of November 2018 as Veterans Month in the City of Norman and urge all Americans to acknowledge the courage and sacrifice of our veterans through appropriate public ceremonies and private prayers. And I think Roger Gallagher is coming up to see major. <laughs> On behalf of the uh, Veterans Committee of about nine members and uh, veterans everywhere in Norman and the community, we thank you for this. It is about, uh, I think it's our eighth time this, this year. We're having uh, similar activities with the ceremony, and this year we're having a parade for the first time in three years after we shortened the route, and it's a little easier for people to, to be a participant now instead of a two-mile walk. Um, we are getting uh, an additional aircraft this year for a static display instead of the Blackhawk. We've gotten the mission requirements uh, have re been reduced just a little, and we're getting a Chinook. And it's an interesting aircraft for people and it'll attract a lot of uh, kids and adults interested in aviation. Also, this is a Sunday, as, as was said, uh, it's one century, 100 years to the day, November 11th, that the first, uh, that the armistice was signed. 
it was called Armistice Day because it was a peace. And uh, that was the term they used, but there were big doubts from the very beginning, simply because it didn't solve anything. As you know, it, it structured a part of the Middle East. It changed some boundaries of countries. It uh, gave the United States the role of being the largest military and most important in the, in the world. So when Korea came by and we had an armistice, people were saying, wait a minute, this is not proper to have the holiday called Armistice Day. So it was changed to Veterans Day. It was changed to Veterans Day by a person named Alvin, whose nephew was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And he started this movement in 1945 to change the day. And when Eisenhower became president, uh, he made it official that it was uh, Veterans Day instead of Armistice Day. Uh, we have a cake. This, this will be the, the uh, poster that you see on the doors around town. We have, a, we have a cake this year to commemorate Armistice Day and to commemorate the century old ceremony. If you look at this, our theme is to honor to serve. Well, this came to us unannounced and it's honoring all who served. And we're going to make a cake from here up, a big full sheet cake. And it's beautiful because this commemorates the poppy, it commemorates the concertina wire, and it commemorates the post to stop the infantry from going forward. Um, that's interesting because the poppy became the flower of people who died in the war. And the poet John McKee there at the time, who was a doctor, uh, he lost one of his good friends there in 1915 in a battle. And uh, he served as a doctor with the unit. He wrote the poem one day looking out at the field and he noticed that the wind was blowing some of the poppies. Uh, making them flex, and he connect, he wrote the poem in Flanders Field, concentrating on how the poppies are such a symbol of people who have died. Um, he himself died three years later of the flu and meningitis. There were about 53,000 people killed in World War I, and almost 25,000 of them died from disease, mainly the flu, because in 1917, it was a huge epidemic of flu, and it killed many people. One other side note here, not to extend too much. Marie Curie was doing a lot of research in uh, radiation with her husband, Pierre, and they won the, the Nobel Prize in uh, 1906. And because they learned that the different chemicals, radium, polonium, and, and all the chemicals they were working with showed different objects, then she was instrumental in helping to develop the X-ray machine. And in World War I, she and a couple of people forming groups opened these X-ray shops and saved many people's lives by being able to picture breaks and the human anatomy, the skeletal anatomy. Skeletal anatomy. So that's, that's one of the interesting things about the World War I, and uh, a lot of things were accomplished, but uh, the, the military's changed a little bit. <clears throat> one of the things we have now is women. And believe it or not, in World War II, there were 400,000 women who were in the military serving for the Americans. 550 of them died in combat, not in, not in any disease or anything. They died in actual combat from invasions and from just enemy action near the lines. In, in uh, Vietnam, there were 11,000 women, mostly nurses, uh, in serving in Vietnam, and 563 of them got killed. One flight of baby... They call it the baby rescue with the nurses taking home the orphans, going to fly them from Vietnam home. The aircraft crashed and everybody died. There are eight, there are, are, there are just examples of things like that in different wars, but to give you a rough idea how women are also serving in war today, 
15% of all the people who are in the military going to the uh, enemy activities in the Middle East are women. And they're also entering some combat roles too. So things are changing in the military. Just wanted to give you sort of a broad overview. And uh, thank you for this. It, uh, it goes with uh, everybody who's ever worn a uniform, if some people know, some of you know here, and some of you in the audience who've served are in the military family. So thank you for your service. And uh, we hope the weather's good. We hope it's not rainy. And the T-6s can fly the flyover after the anthem because Tom Whalen and Cliff Whistler are still going to do it. So uh, let's hope for a, for a good time and uh, one, di one time to do a century. Then we'll wait another 100 years and do another one. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And I, I would encourage everybody to go to the parade and the ceremony. It's, it's really quite inspiring. And I don't think we do enough to honor our veterans. And I think at this time, one of our veterans would like to speak, Council Member Hickman. I just uh, don't usually comment after we've had these proclamations and I appreciate that, uh, Mayor. Uh, these are two proclamations that are very personal to me. Um, I'm a Native American myself and a member of the Cherokee Nation and a dad who raised is raising or is raised uh, three children, trying to teach them about our heritage and culture in our society today is, is and can be a challenge. Um, and so I would just encourage everybody for Native American Heritage Month here in November to try to take a little bit of time, go visit a museum, um, talk to somebody that you know maybe is Native American to learn about their culture. It's how we, through relationships and being kind to each other, how we build an inclusive community and bring bring ourselves together uh, by learning about each other, uh, whether me as a dad trying to teach my children so they can pass it on, or you learning about your neighbor and their cultural diversity. And with regard to the veterans, uh, I absolutely echo what the mayor said. I do encourage you to come. Um, last year, they had a speaker that spoke about the Korean War and his service in the Korean War, and my father served in Korea. And uh, the mayor was there, and she saw me. I was bawling like a schoolboy. <laughs> um, because it is very emotional, uh, whether you have family or parents or spouse that served or um, like myself, I'm also a veteran served in the Air Force. And um, and it is something that I do hope that as a community, we do focus on and try to see what we can do more for for our our uh, veteran community in Norman, which uh, as I know from my own personal experience and talking to many veterans here in Norman and around the country, uh, veterans are usually the last people who will start complaining about something or make demands and they'll be the first ones there to volunteer and just because they aren't banging their fists on the table asking for something doesn't mean that they don't have needs or we shouldn't try to do things to, to help them and um i do encourage everybody to please try to come out on the 11th and uh, show your support for our veterans thank you thank you Item number six is the consent docket. This item is placed on the agenda so that the city council by unanimous consent can designate those routine agenda items that they wish to be approved or acknowledged by one motion. I need a motion to place seven through 32 on the consent docket. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. That was unanimous. Number six of the mayor's appointments of Paul Austin to the Norman Housing Authority and Victoria Harrison, Nancy Morris, and Ann Way to the Social and Voluntary Services Commission. Item 8 is submission of the Finance Director's Investment Report as of September 30th, 2018. Item 9 is submission of the monthly departmental reports for the month of September 2018. Item 10 is the approval of the payment of, of FYE 2019 dues assessment in the amount of $62,568 to the Association of Central Oklahoma Governments for the period of July 1, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. Item 11 is the authorization to purchase equipment, including telephones and associated hardware installation training and a five-year hardware warranty from commercial telecom systems in the amount of $68,900 $50 for the Norman Central Library. Item number 
Let's see, the next 12 items are for the acceptance of the easements and or warranty deeds to be used in conjunction with the 24th Avenue East Bond Project for Lindsay Street to Robinson. Uh, number uh, item 12 is from Alameda Land Company in the amount of $2,140. Item 13 is from Alameda and Company LLC, no amount. Item 14 is a temporary easement donated by Alameda Land Company. 15 is an easement from Bread of Life in the amount of $1,160. Item 16 is also from the Bread of Life in the amount of $170. Um, item 17 is another easement from the same entity for $1,140. Item 18 also from the Bread of Life, $1,185. Item 19 is an easement from Summit Lakes in the amount of $2,630. Item 20 is also an easement donated by Summit Lakes, as is item 21. Item 22 is acceptance of warranty deed from Independent School District number 29 and authorizing payment in the amount of $5,586. Item 23 is the acceptance of a warranty deed by the Bread of Life and authorizing payment in the amount of $2,450. Item 24 is a final plat for Summit Lakes Edition. Section 11, with deferral of street paving, stormwater improvements, and sidewalks in connection with 24th Avenue Southeast, and the acceptance of the public, de public de dedications contained therein and budget appropriation. This is generally located one half mile south of Alameda Street on the east side of 24th Avenue Southeast. Item 25 is consent to encroach for Lot 1, Block 1, Section 2 of Carroll Farm Edition which is 3401 West Tecumseh. Item 26 is acceptance of a grant of the amount of $1,400 from Maddie's Fund to be used by the Animal Welfare Division of the Police Department to, pr to promote and support volunteers' engagement and, cons and encourage responsible pet ownership. Item 27 is an amendment to a contract with Atkins North America, increasing the contract amount by $90,700 for a revised contract amount of $1,099,421.50 to provide additional engineering design services for phase two waterline design services in connection with the 24th Avenue East Improvement Project from Lindsay to Robinson and budget transfer between project accounts. Item 28 is amendment number one to a contract with Architects Design Group, increasing the contract amount by $643,676 for a revised contract amount of $793,706 to include phase two and three of the Emergency Operations and Dispatch Center project. Item 29 is contract with Cleveland County Area Rapid Transit CART in the amount of $635,500 for transportation services through June 30th, 2019. Item 20 is a contract with Center for Children and Families in the amount of $110,000 for use in the Boys and Girls Club of Norman. Item 31 is a resolution authorizing acquisition of real property for the 24th Avenue East Roadway Improvement Project and declaring the necessity for acquiring said property for roadway utility and drainage purposes and authorizing initiation of the eminent domain proceedings. Item 32 is a resolution authorizing acquisition of real property for the 24th Avenue East Roadway Improvement Project and declaring the necessity for acquiring said property for roadway utility and drainage purposes and authorizing initiation of eminent domain proceedings. I need a motion to approve or reject the consent docket. Motion, motion to, to approve. approve. Second. Are there any comments from council regarding any item on the consent docket? It's member Hickman. Um, I noticed that uh, Chris Glenn was here from CART, and I had a couple questions about item number 29. Hi, I'm Chris Glenn. I'm the uh, Director of Parking and Transportation at the University of Oklahoma, also the uh, CART Director. And I've uh, met with many of you throughout the week, and I really appreciate your time throughout the week. Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here, and I appreciate uh, you taking the time 
uh, to meet with me, I guess it was maybe last week, yeah. to discuss this contract and some of the ongoing issues between the city and, and CART. Uh, so I, I do want one first to tell you thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate your time as well. Um, on this contract, I just wanted to clarify for the public and uh, for everybody, it's, is the amount that's included in this contract, is this the amount that the city of Norman budgeted uh, back uh, when our budget was put in place in July, or does this yep. have additional yep. dollar amounts added? No, that, that is correct. It is the budget amount from the summer. There is no increase. I know that the university sent a letter asking for an increase, but this budget does not have an increase. Okay. Uh, number two, um, are the services that are covered by this contract for the CART services, are they the... Uh, are they the same as they have been uh, previously, or does this contract include a cut to services? Uh, it does not include a cut to services now. Okay. There, there could be cuts coming. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Thank you. I, I will. I do. Thank you for time. I really appreciate oh. that. And I'm glad to, I'm glad to get this uh, finalized. One thing that I will say, and I think that it's been in the public is, is that if there were going to be cuts, um, we had, uh, we'd put out there Saturday service elimination because of low ridership. We'd also put out there and probably mistakenly. So uh, card access zone two, which is disability service. I can tell you that if we make any uh, service changes based on we operate. Um, we operated a four hundred and thirty thousand dollar loss two years ago. Operated at a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar loss last year. Uh, we cut some university routes first. We thought it was important to do that over the over the summer. Cut some university routes. Um, still left us at about a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar deficit. Um, so we will likely make some service changes, uh, probably some frequency on the Alameda and Main Street routes, uh, Saturday service elimination, uh, but we will not touch card access. That, okay. is, that is very important. Thank you, Chris. Let me ask a couple of quick follow-up questions then. Uh, one, so there are no, um, currently in this contract, there is no cut to disability services, then there are no plans to cut services to the disability community for transportation? Not at all. We, we will absolutely not do that. Okay. And number two, if you guys do choose to make changes to services, as you mentioned, that, that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of summarize for the public uh, what that process is and how there is an opportunity for sure. public involvement in that? Yeah, sure. It is a very public process. So uh, getting the contract tonight, which we're very grateful for, will likely still put us at somewhat of a, an operating deficit we would likely make an announcement in the next week or so about um, a public meeting. The public meeting would be, and this is all uh, federal transit um, ad administration. Uh, this is the way that, that they mandate that it goes. So we would make an announcement whenever we're ready to, to make those changes. Uh, the meeting would be 30 days from that announcement. So let's just say that October, let's say November 1st, we decide to make an announcement that we would make service changes on December 1st, just, for, to make it easy, on December 1st, there would be two public meetings, probably the first and the second, there would be public meetings uh, in which the public is invited to comment on, on the changes that we would make. And then you cannot make a service change until 30 days after that public meeting. So from really 60 days from when you make an announcement is when you can make any service adjustments. Uh, Want to be clear, we, throughout the years, we, we make service adjustments. It's, it's, some, it's something that we do. We did it over the summer. We changed the West Norman link route. We, we took Saturday service away from that. Uh, shortened the hours, uh, just made it fit within the budget and fit within the ridership. There's also a ridership demand. Um, so uh, something that we, that we typically do. Um, is make service changes throughout the year and follow those um, public processes. Okay, and as you and I discussed, um, now that hopefully we've gotten this agreement agreed upon and, and behind us, is that now um, from CART's perspective, from your perspective, open up the opportunity for us to move forward with this long-term discussion about where we go in the future, what does the relationship between the city and CART look like, how do we begin to separate services? Yes, sir. I think that is accurate. I think getting uh, this year's budget situation handled, which I hope we're doing here tonight, um, and then we can have some longer term discussions about the future of public transportation in Norman and how that's best operated. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Councilmember Beerman. Chris, wait. <laughs> and we have Hi, another Hi. one, too. So Okay. All right. Um, I did just have one clarifying yeah. question, uh, kind of make sure that everyone understands sure. um, that no matter what level of funding the city provides for you, uh, provides for CART, I should say, not for you, mm -hmm. um, the city does not have any say in what routes are run, how frequently they're run, and when or if services are changed. 
That is correct. The dynamic of the relationship is, is that the city of Norman is a funder of CART, um, but CART itself makes service changes and adjustments. Right. That we are not the operator of the service and therefore we don't, I mean, we can make suggestions sure. and, you know, reach out to push one way or the other on things, but we don't, we don't have a say in what services are. Achieving. That is correct. Although we do like to be very mindful of what citizens and especially council have to say. Appreciate it. Yeah. Just comment at that juncture that um, Chris or one of his representatives comes to our community transportation and planning every month and does a report. And that's an opportunity for the council as your representatives to give input as to the cart. And those are often lively discussions. They are. Council Member Holman. I just wanted to uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with me last week as well. Sure. Um, you know, I shared with you my history of using cart since I was in middle school and um, how important public transportation is to me and, and has been throughout my life. Um, and for me, having the university being almost entirely within the ward I represent, it's very important that we have a public transportation system that works for students and the residents of Norman as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, working with CART and the university going forward uh, to come to some sort of solution that works the best for everybody and I definitely left our meeting feeling much more confident about where we're at and uh, the potential that we might have to do some some good stuff in the future. So I uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. I enjoyed meeting with you as well. Okay, you you may go ahead and sit down. I, I'm I'm going to make a comment, but you you don't have to stand up through the whole thing and listen because I don't really expect a response. Um, the CART has been a partnership between the city of Norman and the University of Oklahoma for 33 some odd years. They have carried literally millions of passengers. Last year alone, they carried a million passengers. As was mentioned earlier, we help with the funding. Um, we help that the, it, it helps them get their federal funding, but they do all the hef, heavy lifting of, of CART. They buy the buses, they hire the drivers, they do the routes, and they, they do all that hard work. And it has been an immense benefit to the residents of this community. Now, there was some real misunderstandings back in the summer. We got a letter from CART, the university, basically saying that they were having huge financial problems. We were not aware of that and that either the city needed to pay considerably more money or we needed to cut services. And it took all of us off guard. It was very upsetting. We don't want to lose services for our residents and we don't want our residents worrying constantly about what's going to happen tomorrow, whether or not that cart access van is going to show up or the cart bus is going to show up. Um, so right after the letter, we had a good long meeting and we agreed that the what, what's happening right now financially, whether we like it or not, is not sustainable. And it either the city is going to have to pay a lot more the university is going to have to pay more or we're going to have to find ways to change and adapt the operations of our system. We don't want our residents to lose service. Um, and, and the whole point of this long-term transition is to help us make, with the help of a consultant, with the help of FTA, with the help of ACOG, work out what this new organization will look at look like for the citizens of our community. And I can promise you both the city and the university are committed to that process. So I want to thank Chris for being here. I'm glad we have gotten this contract um, out of the way. And now it's time for the challenge of figuring out how we're going to keep the buses running. So thank you very much. Okay, item 33. Oh, the motion on the floor is to approve the consent docket. Council members, you may cast your vote.
All votes have been cast and the motion to approve the consent docket passes unanimously. Item 33 is a resolution authorizing execution of the trust agreement and indenture of the Regional Transportation Authority of Central Oklahoma. I'll entertain a motion to adopt or reject the resolution. Motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Um, and Catherine Holmes is here to make the presentation. Catherine has been the consultant that has been working with the cities on the trust indenture. Thank you. Nice to see you again this evening. I appreciate being here. I wanted to give a brief overview of the trust indenture that is before you for approval this evening. Um, as you know, the city of Norman has been participating as part of a task force that has been studying the creation of a regional transportation authority for a good 10 to 12 years. The last year, we've been very focused on uh, creating the legal structure to form the entity, and that is what's before you tonight. Um, I have um, the boundary of the proposed regional transportation authority is reflected on the screen uh, above, and you can see it. Um, it is um, large enough to encompass the anticipated population and employment projections through the year 2040 and beyond. Um, so when the RTA is created, that would be the boundary of the service area of the Regional Transit Authority. The member jurisdictions of the um, initial beneficiaries of the RTA are the same cities that have been participating in the task force. They are Oklahoma City, Norman, Edmond, Moore, Midwest City, and Dell City. We're in the process now of going to each of the city councils of those cities and getting the approval in each of the, each of the jurisdictions. When the um, RTA is formed, appointments will be made by the member jurisdictions. There would be seven board members, one for each member city, with Oklahoma City having two. The initial term of the board members will be concurrent, will run concurrent with their creation of the RTA to end on June 30th in the year following a successful rent referendum establishing a dedicated funding source for RTA operations. It was felt by the task force that there would be tremendous benefit to have the um, the initial board serve that uh, term without um, new members coming on or off to make sure that there is um, um, some institutional memory and control being made on these decisions that are being made prior to um, going out for a vote. Thereafter, um, there would be a transitional term with four members serving four years, three members serving two years, and then after that, we will be on staggered terms for the RTA board. Um, a director is subject to removal only by action of the governing board appointing the director. Their requirements, the eligibility requirements for um, board members are also established in the trust indenture. A director may not be an employee of a county or city appointing the director, may not be an employee of a public transportation provider operating in the region, may not currently be an elected official, and must be a resident of the appointing municipality for at least one year before the date of appointment and continuing during the board service. We also um, establish certain voting protocols to um, encourage regional participation and uh, try and achieve some equity among the board members. And we do that by um, making sure that certain certain matters are approved with a 60% weighted vote of the board members. and. Uh, I will tell you um, the, the matters that require approval of 67%, and then I will show you the weighted uh, vote on the next slide. But those matters that require 67% weighted vote include pledging of assets, approving a budget, major service changes, determining the tax rate to be on a ballot, a decision to acquire, construct, or operate a rail line, must be approved by 67% of the weighted vote of the, of the entire board. It also must be approved by a majority of the representatives of member cities through which the rail line traverses. Uh, to approve the acquisition of a transit provider and the associated liability of assets requires 67% weighted vote, as does a vote to issue debt. A vote to issue debt must also be approved by the governing bodies of the beneficiary cities in addition to the board itself. All other acts of the board would require the affirmative vote of a majority of the members of the board. So that would be four out of seven tally votes. 
after a vote of the members is taken, a weighted vote may be called at any time by members of three jurisdictions. Um, and then the weighted vote in that situation would, would pass with 51% of the total weighted vote. No city has more than 58% of the weighted vote, regardless of the actual sales tax um, uh, generated in that city. And the board apportionment and voting protocols will be reviewed after each decennial census beginning in the year 2030. So the voting protocols are on this slide here. You can see that um, Oklahoma City generates 66.39% of the sales tax. Um, notwithstanding that, I mentioned previously their vote, the weighted vote for Oklahoma City is capped at 58%, uh, regardless of the actual sales tax generated. The cities of Norman and Edmond have a 14% weighted vote each. The cities of Moore, Midwest City, and Dell City have a 6.6% weighted vote each. Um, the RTA also will have the power to utilize provisions of the Local Development Act. This is um, a provision that is included in the enabling legislation that was passed by the state of Oklahoma's the legislature in 2014. Um, the RTA's power to utilize the provisions is limited and it relates to its ability to use them for financing. So the RTA may issue tax apportionment bonds with the approval of the governing bodies of the beneficiaries, i.e. the city councils. They may also use incremental revenues derived from an increment district to pay principal interest or premium associated with such indebted indebtedness. So for example, if the city of Norman had a, a tax increment uh, financing district, the incremental revenues derived from that increment district could be transferred to the RTA to for the RTA to use for purposes of paying down some of the revenue bonds associated with the uh, debt that they had taken out. But that would be a decision of the city. Correct. There are provisions for um, cities that are not in this um, now initially forming the RTA to annex the RTA at a future time. A new city may be added as a beneficiary and receive transportation services. There are some conditions to that. The new city must be adjacent to a city that is part of the RTA so that we're not creating a gap in service. The RTA board would need to agree to provide services to that new city. The new city would have to put the question on the ballot and it would have to be approved by the majority of the voters in that city. And then the new city would have to agree in a um, interlocal agreement with the RTA to accept a financial obligation in an amount equal to the city's apportioned share of the RTA's outstanding obligation at that time. There are also provisions for a city to withdraw from the RTA and um, they the city would have to call an election and put the question of withdrawal on the ballot and if it were approved on the effective date of the draw of the withdrawal, the RTA would stop providing transportation services within the withdrawn city, and the financial obligations of the withdrawn city would cease to accrue. However, the sales tax will continue in the withdrawn city until the amount of revenue from the RTA sales tax collected in a withdrawn city equals the total financial obligation of the city at the time of withdrawal. So there would be some period of time where the sales tax presumably would continue to um, be collected to, until the uh, obligation had been paid off. If um, a city withdraws and that city happened to have real estate or improvements located in its jurisdiction, the title to those improvements or real estate would immediately vest in the RTA with an agreement that the RTA could continue to use the real estate and improvements for a period of 25 years or the duration of the RTA's remain, remaining federal grant obligations for the facility, whichever is longer. So that's a summary of the um, of the indenture. I'm happy to answer any other specific questions that you might have. I might just make a comment that in drawing up the agreement, I think all of the city's attorneys also had an opportunity. We're, we're really asked for input on the indenture. And then it also they've come to the council before for input. So. Um, I think all the cities have had quite a bit of information about this and have had a chance to give input and it was unanimous when we agreed that we were ready to move forward as cities. Um, Councilmember Castleberry. A uh, quick question on the directors. Are they compensated? No. Yeah. Other questions? 
Councilmember Beerman. If you recall, there, uh, Councilmember Hickman at our study session had a question about uh, the Land Use Act and the use of TIFs for financing in this. Did we get an answer to that? I didn't see anything I, in an email. So. I thought she answered it, but you, you want to repeat the... Yeah. Sorry, did I miss that? And and I did forward a letter. I'm sorry if you didn't have a chance to review that. But um, the RTA has... Uh, has the ability to use provisions of the Local Development Act for financing purposes. So um, it, it, it doesn't have the, the RTA does not have the power to create a TIF, um, to have any input into the jurisdiction or the project planning of that, but it can, it can issue tax apportionment bonds with the approval of um, the governing body of the beneficiaries, so the city councils, it may also use the, um, if, if, for example, the city of Norman had a TIF in its city boundary and it wanted to transfer some incremental revenues from the TIF to the RTA for use by the RTA to pay off some of the indebtedness, that would be permitted. And those are the only two uh, provisions of the Local Development Act that are available to the RTA. Apologies for missing that. I guess I just skipped right over it when I was reading through. <laughs> Well, also, I, I had asked the question of John, and then Catherine had gotten back. We had we had a discussion about it yesterday afternoon, and I just, with all the other stuff that got sent out, I, I didn't go ahead and forward that out to the whole council. So we'll make sure that they get that. I'm sorry? No, you didn't. It it just the the conversation happened like yesterday morning and yesterday afternoon, and I just I didn't get it out this morning. So it, it will send it out to everybody what was said. Any other questions? All right, this is a time for the audience if you have any comments or questions. Mayor and Council, uh, I'm Marion Hutchison, uh, 5220 Montrose Circle. Uh, it's kind of exciting to be here. Uh, seems like some of the times I'm down here, it's to oppose something I disagree with, but. Uh, tonight, hopefully, I'm here to encourage you on something that we all uh, share uh, a positive outlook on. Uh, I started work on these issues with OnTrack, and Charles Westner, who's with OnTrack, is also here, more than a decade ago. And since then, I've turned gray. And at the time, I didn't have a son, and I brought him here tonight. Uh, he's 12 and uh, <laughs> working on a citizenship in the community merit badge to learn about transit. And, uh, my only hope is that we actually have trains running by the time he's in college in a decade and I retire. And yeah. so if I've learned anything, it's that probably like a lot of other issues, water rights and things like this, it takes a long time. And so uh, the legal part of it and the uh, agreements you're looking at can kind of be the mundane part. So I thought it'd be good to talk about how uh, this is really kind of a historic event in that I can't think of any other issues and might be able to add in on this other than maybe discussions on water where all the municipalities in the metro area have ever come together as a whole uh, for something regional that's so important. And I can't think of anything more important than water is transportation. And uh, I work in Edmond quite a bit at our office. And so over the last decade, I've watched the commute back and forth on I-35, and I think all of you have done it at some point. And, you know, we've just kind of reached the point where it's time to do this. And uh, I think you've seen some of my information I've sent you, and there's a lot of excitement about where we're going. So I just wanted to say thanks for all the uh, encouragement from the city over the years, and um, I look forward to working with everybody as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you, Marion. Marion is one of a number of different people uh, from Norman, like Charles Westner, like Tom Sherman, like our former mayor, Cindy Rosenthal, who is still the chair of the RTA committee, um, like Council Member Castleberry, like Council Member Holman now, that have been active on this committee. And Norman has really played a key role and I just, I think this is such an important juncture for us that we're actually 
getting ready to start the process that will move us towards the actuality of voting on a possible sales tax to start funding. Um, and this is going to allow us to do a lot of things like start looking at uh, uh, getting right of ways along the railroad tracks and that kind of thing. It also has implications for us in terms of CART, um, because if we're going to a regional transit authority, and I've mentioned this before, then that's something that could be happening within the next five years, and we've got to keep that in our mind. Council Member Holman. I wanted to comment about uh, how excited I am about this personally. I probably first heard about on track in 2008 or so, and um, several years before I even thought about running for city council. Um, but I knew then that it was an issue I was really interested in. Um, I got exposed to the DART system in Dallas when I was a kid. Um, I regularly used the train system in Dallas to go to the OU Texas game and things like that. Um, right after I got elected in 2013, I had a long conversation with the mayor of Edmond um, after one of their meetings. And he told me about how excited he was about the economic benefits and potential for downtown Edmond and, and uh, how a lot of Edmond residents would really enjoy using the train to come to Norman for OU football games instead of driving and parking and all that stuff. So, um, and then outside of the trains, which are, you know, the real fun part to talk about, but the a metropolitan wide bus system services places like Moore uh, that don't currently have any kind of public transportation system at all. Uh, is really important, I think. And as Marion mentioned, the metropolitan area, all these cities coming together like this uh, uh, is something that doesn't really happen very often. And so it's really exciting for me. I I'm hoping that we can get those trains running in the next 10 years as well. So um, I'm glad that we're finally getting to this point. It's a really important step and I'm excited about where we're going from here. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Bierman. So as someone who made the commute to and from Oklahoma City every day for the last nine years before finally giving it up, um, I'm also really excited about formally launching this process. Um, I was lucky enough to go to college in Washington, D.C. They have a very enviable uh, metro system between bus and uh, subway. They call it the metro, though. Don't call it the subway. Um, and I also benefited, and I think the city did as well, from uh, connecting so closely with Baltimore and being able to take Amtrak to Baltimore very inexpensively. It didn't take a long time. Uh, I think both cities really benefited from that regionality. And so... Uh, I love this opportunity. I think this is going to be really good for Norman as well as for the other communities in this region. And I'm really looking forward to formally kicking it off. Other comments? Thank you all so much for coming. This, um, the motion on the floor is to adopt the resolution. Council members, you may cast the vote. I'll vote to approve the resolution passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 34 is a public hearing regarding acceptance of a grant in the amount of $17,507 to the City of Norman and Cleveland County from the United States Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance through the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant Program with Norman's portion of $15,758 to be used by the Police Department for forensic training and associated travel approval of the contract and budget appropriations from the grant revenue account. I'll entertain a motion to conduct the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion on the floor is to conduct a public hearing by the show of hands. All those in favor? Opposed? That was unanimous. And John Stege is here from the police department, I believe. Good evening, and thank you for having me here. My name is John Stege. I'm the standards administrator at the police department. I also do the grants for the police department. Um, more than happy to answer any questions that uh, we might have on the, the 2018 Justice Assistance Grant. Oh, 
I guess maybe just uh, a brief, you know, what is, does the whole department get this type of training? Is it just a specific area? I guess what is, what does it entail, I guess? Great. Thank you for your question. Um, first of all, a little history on the JAG grant. The JAG grant is an annual formula grant uh, that's disseminated to police departments uh, across the country. Um, we've gotten it for over a decade. Um, we share it with the Cleveland County. Um, we have to we have to share the funding, so they get an uh, an allocation of that. Um, we decided several years ago that the funding would go towards our forensic services, and so that's uh, that's where the bulk of this funding is going to from us. The program actually funds a broad base of law enforcement services, equipment, personnel, um, and programs but we use it for our forensic services because those are fairly expensive training uh, uh, opportunities. And, and uh, um, what happens is that if we don't have an outside funding source, then we use most of our training funds just for a couple of people. So this is an excellent opportunity to get some training for those people who need it um, uh, and still have funding left over for operational training for our normal operations. Uh, it depends on what they are. The, the specific areas that are funded in, in this request are computer forensics uh, training. And although that is actually an online training, um, there's not much of it out there. So it's all very expensive. Um, we also have two forensic in, uh, technicians that work in our lab at the investigation center. Um, their expertise is one where they've exhausted all state remedies and local remedies for training. So they always have to go out of state for training. And so that's several thousand dollars just for one training session. And both of them are required to have annual um, uh, continuing education. We also use it for our digital forensic video uh, uh, expert. Um, and again, um, that expert has to go out of state for training. Uh, and again, it's thousands of dollars just for one trip and for the training. And then finally, we have our crime scene technicians uh, who get certified in various levels of reconstruction, crime scene reconstruction and things of that nature. Um, and again, those are advanced trainings for professional or continuing education uh, requirements. And again, they're fairly expensive. He answered my question. Thank you. Oh, yes, ma'am. And Gallagher 2513 would so drive around my dress. Um, I cannot imagine trying to do the job our police officers do without having this extra support in order to do the training that they need to do their job. Please approve this. Motion to close the public hearing. Motion so, to close. Second. Second. Motion on the floor is to close the public hearing by a show of hands. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. That was unanimous. I'll entertain a motion to accept or reject the grant. Motion, motion to accept. Second. Motion on the floor is to accept the grant. Council members, you may cast your votes. All votes have been cast and the motion to accept the grant is approved unanimously. Council remarks should be directed to the council as a whole and limited to five minutes or less. Are there any <clears throat> miscellaneous remarks? 
If not, that brings us to, to item 36. This is consider. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on in. 2513 Woodsong. I forgot to mention every year we get a support a little bit from the city, but we get a lot from staff. We get coordination. They take care of our communication. They take care of contacting some people around the city. They coordinate activities with the groups coming in. They do a lot of the paperwork. Uh, Judd Foster's in the middle of all this. He coordinated with, with OU because OU has put some rules on the route that we're having and he smoothed that out for us. They do a lot of work for the community, for the, for the committee and public safety on, uh, yeah, <laughs> on the uh, Veterans Committee. And Judd and Carla now taking Cheryl Sheriff's place is every bit as good and helpful. And sometimes people don't say enough about the staff people they have. But our committee looks forward to working with them every time, every year, and they do a great job. Just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That that's do a tremendous job for that event and many, many others. So we appreciate Judd and his staff. Item 36 is consideration of adjourning into executive session authorized by Oklahoma statutes, Title 25, to discuss negotiations regarding employees and representatives of employee groups and authorized by the Oklahoma statutes, Title 25, uh, to discuss pending litigation associated with the Golden Tribes LLC versus the City of Norman, Cleveland County, um, and Flesky Holding Company versus City of Norman, Cleveland County, um, court case and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn out of the city council meeting and convene into exe executive session. Motion to adjourn. Could we do public comment? Second. We did miscellaneous. Bit of, yeah. Executive session. Usually we don't do those before we do. We can come back and do public comments. If you want to do public comments, we can do public comments. I don't, I don't care. You want to do public comments? Okay, we'll start Last down there. Time. Okay, we'll start down there. Council Member Bierman. So, um, First of all, I just want to say I am working on trying to nail down a date for a ward meeting. I wanted to have one next Thursday, and then I was told that we might be having another city council study session next Thursday. Please, everyone, put pressure on them to have no one. No? Okay. Then we're going to have a ward one meeting <laughs> Thursday, November 1st at 5 o'clock at the Eastside Library in the community room. We will talk stormwater. We'll talk transportation bond. We'll talk changing tables. We'll talk elections. We'll talk everything. So uh, see you guys there. I will be there for two hours. I am also trying to rustle up someone to provide some child care. So you can bring your kids, enjoy a little bit of our brand new Eastside Library. Um, also looking forward to having a happy Halloween. I have been sampling all of the Halloween candy that I bought to give out because I have to make sure that it's safe. And uh, because I live in Summit Lakes, I'm planning on having at least 350 trick-or-treaters. Let's beat last year. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got. Thanks, guys. No comment. Just briefly, tomorrow night at um, six o'clock. Six o'clock. Uh, Emma, five o'clock threw me off there. Uh, at six o'clock, we're having a Ward Three meeting at the West Side Library. What date is that? It's tomorrow night. Councilmember Hickman. In order to encourage Councilmember Casper to make a further donation to support our animal welfare center, I will I will recuse from making any public comments tonight and pass my time. That's a hundred bucks. Councilmember Wilson. <laughs> I love it when you do that. Um, okay, I do have some important things. So I think uh, Councilmember Behrman for stop of the train there for us to have these comments real quick. 
Um, October 28th, park, a little axe park cleanup, uh, three to five at little axe community center, uh, and Frisbee golf course. And we'll be, um, there'll be some, I think refreshments and, um, gloves and trash bags so we can clean up our community. Also, there's a watershed cleanup workshop November 3rd from 1 to 3, and the sailing club, if the weather permits, will be hosting pontoon rides. Ooh. So that's it. That Thank fun. you. All right. That's well, I know that Councilmember Hickman would want to mention Halloween on Campus Corner, so we can still make this donation happen, and I will be the one to share that one. Sunday, right? From 2 to 4. Okay. Uh, also on Sunday, there's uh, Cheers and Beers at Legacy Park. It's like a wine walk. Uh, and Legacy Park is one of the city parks that you can't have alcohol in. So I wanted to make sure we knew about that. Uh, there are tons of community events coming up Thursday at Sam Noble. There's the spooktacular Fall Fest from 4 to 7. Then Friday, there is a Halloween movie at Norman Public Library East from 5 to 7.30. You can finish that and head downtown for the Fall Festival. And if you want to stay indoors, Parks and Recreation has their Moonlight Masquerade Family Dance. And I would like to say thank you to Mr. Foster for rearranging the family events. One of the things I spoke to you about in our meeting when I first got elected was why don't we have a family event for Norman? We have uh, the daddy-daughter dance and the mummy-son dance, but what about single-parent families or same-sex parents? And it gets difficult to have a family event. So I was very excited to see this one transition. And I know a lot of moms wanted to get a little more dressed up uh, for their event with their son. So that's fantastic. I also want to thank Roger Gallagher. I think he stepped out, um, but, but his wife, Ann is here. She'll pass it on. I, I really appreciate all that he has done for the veteran community here in Norman. Uh, I'm very proud to have him and Ann in Ward 6. They're big proponents of the Norman Police Department and very active citizens. And we need more of that in the Norman community, frankly. And I wanted to end on, on a comment about our current relationship with the University of Oklahoma. Besides Chris Glenn, I've, have any of you been approached by a representative from the University of Oklahoma on any of the crucial activities that we have going on? So I wanna take this moment and invite the university to come to the table to discuss several issues that impact quality of life in our community. Recent interactions have given the impression that the university believes they live in a silo within the Norman community and do not need to have a respectful and productive relationship with the city in which it is located. I disagree. Public transportation, infrastructure, and amenities like the one that will be built through the Norman Forward Initiative are important to Norman, but also to the growth and success of the university. For example, when the university attempts to recruit top faculty and researchers to campus, I assure you, they are looking at the Norman community. They are looking at our public transportation, our infrastructure, and our quality of life amenities, among other things. The university is stronger when Norman does better, and Norman does better when its relationship with the university is stronger. While I can appreciate this is a time of transition on campus, it is time to make restoring a positive relationship with the city of Norman a priority. It is well past time for that, frankly. Now maybe that looks like creating a city liaison petition or position or possibly attending a city council meeting, but at the very least, finish the land swap deal so that we can move forward on projects that benefit us both. It's my understanding that the new uh, uh, valuations of the land have come back. And I know that there is a lot of disappointment that's been voiced by several council members about not seeing this on the region's agenda. Well, I'm sure glad that we're considering just selling beer at OU football games. I would think this is a priority as well. So I hope that we will see this on the next region's agenda. Because again, we're all in it together. We will do better when you do better and you do better when we do better. Thank you. Council Member Holman. Well, I agree with all of that. I think uh, we've, we also probably need to start uh, having a conversation about uh, other options that we might need to explore. But I think that's the goal for everybody is a relationship where we work together. <laughs> um, I am probably going to have a Ward 7 meeting, probably going to wait until the beginning of December to do it. 
Um, but uh, to talk about transportation, stormwater, uh, all these other big issues that we have going on in the city. And maybe there's some issues that are important to Ward 7 residents that I don't know about yet. Um, also, I would let you know, you don't have to wait for a ward meeting to talk to me either. I uh, work the door at the deli on campus corner every Monday and Wednesday night from 9 to 2 a.m. And I mostly just sit out in the front and watch the cars go by and stuff. So it's not uncommon for people to come down there and uh, ask questions about the city or just talk and stuff. So I welcome that, of course. And uh, we'll be having a, a formal meeting uh, in December probably to talk about those issues. And I would just assure everybody in Norman that there's a lot of big issues the council is trying to juggle right now. Um, they're all important. I think this whole council agrees that, uh, that these issues are a priority that we want to get them done. Um, and I know the process is slow, so it sometimes seems like maybe we don't care about a certain issue or whatnot because it's not moving along fast enough. But I know after five years on this council that everyone up here does care greatly. None of us would be sitting up here if we didn't. And uh, having projects and issues sitting out there that people are real passionate about and that we haven't been able to solve is not comfortable for any of us to have to deal with. So we are working, we are juggling multiple big issues at once, and there's just a lot going on in Norman. We are, a, a, again, the third largest city in the state of Oklahoma. There's so much going on. There's so much change that's happening in our community and um, it's exciting, but it can be stressful as well. So I appreciate everybody that comes to these meetings, that's watching at home and uh, continues to help us uh, uh, make Norman a better place for everybody. Thank you. Can you hear me? I've been told I'm soft spoken. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all for continuing to come. I know you have to be here, but thanks for sitting and listening to us as we drag on. And uh, thank you fellow council members and mayor and Brenda for allowing us to suspend the rules and make public comment before we adjourn into executive session. So tomorrow I'm getting my wisdom teeth extracted. And so I'm going to um, speak while I still have a chance. So <clears throat> fun fact. And so, um, you know, tonight we talked about the stormwater utility before we came over to this meeting and um, the bond and utility, a little bit about transportation and what ballot we're gonna put that on. And my fellow council member brought up a really good question to our finance director, which is how long can we continue to subsidize stormwater out of our general fund? And we were informed that it, we can only continue this trend for about two more years until um, we go negative. So that, brought to my attention, how long can we continue to subsidize businesses in the University North Park TIF? If we are struggling to fund core services like CART, which is something that we're going to, that we are considering right now, as well as stormwater, and we aren't going to be able to keep our promises to our citizens, how is it fair that we continue this, this uh, subsidy until 2023? when we're gonna go negative on stormwater in 2020. It doesn't really make fiscal sense to me. It seems irresponsible. Um, I did say that I support continuing the business improvement district in the University of North Park because that's different. It's not diverting sales tax dollars away from our city's general fund. And I think that's a, a crucial difference when we're struggling again to fund our core services. So, um, like Councilmember Clark said, we, we need to do better. Thank you. We have a motion on the, the floor to adjourn into executive session. Do I have a second? Oh, we have the second. Motion on the floor is to adjourn and um, into executive session and reconvene the city council. Oh, I'm sorry, I've gotten off. Okay, let's try again. They already voted on that. Oh, oh, I see, we had comments. All right, by a show of hands, everybody that wants to move into executive session, thank you. All those opposed? That was unanimous. <laughs>